Evening all and welcome to a Factions Overview for Prophecy of Pendor, a mod for Mountain Blade Warband which adds many gameplay features and a hell of a lot of lore. I'll leave a link in the description for those interested and who haven't already got the mod. Now there are five main factions in the game with dozens of smaller factions like Knighthood Orders and random spawns with named and deadly leaders. If you want to look at any specific faction just click their crest here da -da, and the magics of the internet will take you to that part of the video. Preceding the game's time frame, there was a great kingdom of Pendor, from which the name of the mod comes from, but it fractured rather violently, leaving the kingdom of Sarleon as its only heir, so it's fair that we look at them first. The kingdom of Sarleon is situated smack bang in the middle of the map, and that means war on all fronts. To the southeast is the Empire, to the southwest the Dushar, to the west is the Feardsfane, and then to the north is Ravenstern. To the northeast is where the Jatu horsemen run riot, and in the east, the forests of the Noldor Twilight Nights. Sarleon's universal symbol is the lion, a symbol of courage as long as anyone can remember. Pendor's very own Lionheart, King Ulric rules the kingdom with an iron fist, opposing all who stand against him. One such enemy is Sir Darlene of Pendor, a pretender to the throne, and you may side with him if you wish. Ulric is a very interesting character, and someone has written a wonderful piece on him in the forums, link down below. Now, if you're going to field a Sarlian army, cavalry take up the lion's share of your party. They are without doubt the best non-noble heavy cavalry in the game, armed to the teeth with lances and claymore swords. Now, the infantry is rather average, unable to soak up cavalry charges like the Feardsvane shield walls, and not as powerful in melee combat as the Dushar. Admittedly, their halberds deal rather colossal damage, but their complete lack of shields makes them practically pin cushions when facing any number of ranged troops. Now, moving on to ranged troops, the ranged part of your army is going to be quick firing, low damage longbowmen. They excel in sieges, but really fall flat in the open field battles if not protected with a line of infantry. Now, something to note in the mod, tactics are key. You will not get very far without using basic combat lines, the AI does so you'll be behind before you've even started. The Knights of the Lion are Sarleon's unique knighthood order, and let me tell you, these guys are brutal. Equipped with only the very best tools for impaling and skewering opponents, they have 440 weapon proficiency in one and two handed weapons, and also pole arms. A charge from a small contingent of these guys can be absolutely devastating, easily being able to turn a battle round. Moving on to the northern kingdom of Ravenstern, formed as a big screw you to Pendor. In the mod's lore, they refuse to come to the north's aid against Mist Mountain Raiders. A dragon is said to help them in their toughest of battles, therefore, on their crest is the Dragon of Legend. King Gregory IV is the ruler of the Snowy Waste. In game, however, he does have a slight disadvantage. He does not have a unique unit in his armies like other kings, nothing too major, but something to think about nonetheless. Now, tactics with an army comprised wholly, or at least mostly, of Ravenstone troops will have one focus, the archers, mounted or on foot. They wield longbows with more expertise than the Sarlians and pack a significant punch. However, like in this video, if not shielded by a line of infantry, expect some losses. In equine warfare, Ravenstone is standard. Not too strong, not too weak. Their knights are strong, like any other factions, but it's their mounted rangers you'll fall in love with. Crack shots and highly mobile, try a battle with these guys and never look back. The kingdom's infantry are a tad too light for my taste. A lack of heavy armour, even at higher levels, puts me off. They seem to get bested by everyone they pick a fight with, however, if they live long enough to get to enemy lines, their axes and claymores will cause serious damage. In any army of Ravenstern, the Knights of the Dragon will shine, although not as strong in combat as the Knights of the Lion from Sarleon, they are cheaper and not arrogant, decadent fools. Ravenstone is my favourite faction by far, so forgive me if I've been biased either way. Now I know the stats aren't as high, weapon proficiencies etc, but it seems to me like the Knights of the Dragon do a better job, but get them in the game and you'll see. At one with the sea and at odds with being sober are the Feardsvane, hardy Viking-like people from the west. The kingdom was formed after the fall of Pendor from three highly mercantile cities on the coast. Ruling the kingdom and drinking it dry is Kanuga Valdis, your typical Nordic warlord. In his armies are fielded Valdis Huskals, his unique unit. These guys are outrageous on the battlefield, and even more so on the enemy's castle walls, which is in fact where most of the Feardsvane's troops excel. 
There are no cavalry units, apart from the Lady Valkyries, who we will look at in a second. Armed to the teeth and renowned for being the best close quarter fighters in Pendor are the Fierdsvane Infantry. Using a shield and axe, these guys can advance upon lines of archers and take no damage. The short range of their war axes, however, means that cavalry armed with lances can wipe them out extremely easily. So be aware of this Achilles heel in an otherwise amazingly good fighter. Huntsmen comprise the ranged part of the army. Whilst not exactly top marksmen, Fierdsvane archers can fight with a sword or axe without too much of a deficit. They really are just skirmishers who, in my opinion, should be told to hold fire and use melee weapons as soon as the enemy starts to get close. As I was saying, the Lady Valkyries are the order unique to the Fierdsvane. With disgusting strength and hit points, they can survive long enough to make up for their slight lack of weapon proficiency points compared to other orders. These war women are unique in that they upgrade from heroine adventurers instead of faction specific and hard to come by noble men slash women. As I tend to enjoy mounted warfare really, I shy away from the feared stain. This is not to say that they are weak by any means, they just don't fit my style of play. Roaming the southern deserts, trying desperately not to settle down are the Dishar. Historically nomadic tribesmen forced to settle down by the constant Fierdsvain raids. Turn to raiding themselves, any caravan going down the sandy paths of their realm must watch out. Having banded together all the tribes under one crown, Kadun Bahuda Khan leads the Dushar into battle, riding alongside fearsome wind riders. Likening them to Mongols inevitably in your head, you jump to conclusions and guess that cavalry prowess is key to the Dushar. This is not true at all. The cavalry put out by the Dushar are average, if not slightly below par. However, their mounted archers are useful and cheap to maintain. If, however, you do become Lord of the Principalities, you may hire noblemen to fight on horseback for you. And they will do so very well, but until that day settle with troops that fight on foot. The infantry are the backbone of any Dushar army, ranging from spear-wielding horsemen slayers to sword-wielding scorpion assassins. Although mostly lightly armoured, the Blades Masters of the Principalities rival even the Fierdsvane in one-to-one -one combat. Take a few Dishar footmen and a couple of Fierdsvane Huskals to soak up arrows, and you have a fighting force like no other on foot. Wielding short but powerful bows, the archers of the Dishar tend to be mounted, but either on horse or on foot, they will provide much needed range support. Unfortunately, not equipped to be melee fighters as well as archers, as opposed to some other factions, if the enemy reaches your line of desert bowmen, you may need to say your prayers and mean them. A special mention goes to scorpion assassins as they wield throwing knives alongside their sabres. Wind riders are the order of choice for the Dushar. Wielding bows as well as the typical knight lance, these honor troops combine the sword skills of the blade masters and the marksmanship of the desert bowmen superbly and do each of these jobs, in fact, better than their specializer. Another strong point of these desert knights is the speed of their horses. Compared to most heavily armored but slow as hell order horses, these are a welcome change for any skirmish-centric army. Last but not least of the five main factions of Pendor is the Empire. Ruled by a Caesar-like figure, Marius Imperator, meaning laid general, apparently, these regimental people call the warm, sunny southeast of the continent their home. Being more advanced than your average Pandorian in the art of warfare, expect some more high tech weapons. Very much like the Feared's fame, only the nobles of the Empire can afford to take horses into battle, so until you become a Lord of the Empire, you cannot field any mounted troops. This, as you will come to find out, is not so much of a burden if you have foot troops like the Empire does. One important component of the Empire's strength is its heavy and rather badass armour that its soldiers are decked out in. This becomes apparent when you witness your first enemy cavalry charge. You'll find that your archers are surprisingly not decimated. Why that's impossible, you may say. Well, the reason Empire archers can withstand powerful charges is that they wear practically the same armour as the rest of the army. The Empire's ranged troops use crossbows as their weapons of choice. This is abnormal, due to other factions using longbows. The use of huge pavish shields, however, means they have more of a chance to deal damage with the powerful Empire broadsword, as they can get closer to the enemy without being slaughtered. Empire crossbowmen are extremely versatile, and I recommend trying them out at least once in your travels of Pandor. 
Empire infantry are almost universally equipped with throwing weapons, as well as close quarter melee armaments. This gives them the opportunity to deal some damage before the main charge, thinning out enemy ranks for an easier fight. Not that the infantry need this advantage, as they can hold their own in any head-on fight. The Empire's chosen order, the Immortals, are unique. Unique in their knightly ways, as they have chosen to forsake mounts for heightened combat skills. Inducted into the order at a staggering level 55, these men, read demigods, can take on anything that comes their way very comfortably. Masters in swordplay, as their name suggests, they are very hard to take down. Their weapon of choice is anything heavy enough to wield with two hands, Zweihanders and gladiator swords are frequently used. Here is the end of my faction's overview for Prophecy of Pandor. I hope you feel satisfied and informed. If not, please leave some feedback. Thank you very much for watching.